As language evolves and new terms enter the mainstream, teenagers are often blamed for debasing linguistic standards. But, teens don't actually influence language as much as is often claimed. Very commonly, people think that teenagers are ruining language because they are texting or using shorthand or slang. But our language is constantly developing and changing and becoming what it needs to be for the generation who is speaking it. As a linguist, I find this really exciting because it shows me that our language is alive. During high school, teenagers often explore their own identities and may again choose to change their pronunciations and use language as a part of their identities. When these teens grow up and graduate from college or get a job, they may change their language again to sound more professional and meet the demands of their jobs and pressures of the workplace. The fear of teenagers ruining a language, therefore, is baseless. But this does not mean that languages do not need preservation. On one hand, language is evolving primarily because of teenagers, on the other hand, many languages are also under the threat of being dominated by others. Even though teenagers are not responsible for this change, their role in preserving them is crucial. When language, along with cultural wisdom and pride, are no longer passed down to the next generation, children and our society as a whole lose something. The rural poor are divided into subsets based on profession, typically, cultivators who own land and non-cultivators who do not. Cultivators are slightly better off, as they are able to make some money operating farms and charging tenants for using their land. Non-cultivators, however, are extremely poor, working as seasonal laborers on farms. Their pay is both low and erratic, as it is based on the schedules of farm owners and the other few employers available. The rural poor often suffer more than the urban poor because public services and charities are not available to them. Several factors tend to perpetuate rural poverty. For example, political instability and corruption, customs of discrimination, unregulated landlord or tenant arrangements and outdated economic policies often make it impossible for the rural poor to rise above poverty lines. Former residents of rural areas are typically drawn to the city for the perceived wealth of economic opportunities, but often, those dreams fall short. Compared to rural villages, there are indeed more job opportunities in urban areas. However, many migrants lack the skill set to take on many jobs, and positions for unskilled laborers fill up quickly. This shortage of jobs leaves new residents without a steady income, which creates a series of new problems in the city. Ancient myth says that Atlantis was a powerful undersea city, whose warriors conquered many parts of Europe. There is little proof that such a city existed, but human fascination with the world under, the ocean certainly has existed for centuries. Before scientists invented sonar, many people believed the ocean floor was a completely flat surface. Now we know that the seafloor is far from flat. In fact, the tallest mountains and deepest canyons are found on the ocean floor, far taller and deeper than any landforms found on the continents. The same tectonic forces, that create geographical features like volcanoes and mountains on land, create similar features at the bottom of the oceans. New species are discovered in the ocean each year by marine biologists and other ocean scientists. Many of these newly discovered species live deep on the ocean floor in unique habitats, that depend on plate movement, underwater volcanoes, and cold water seeps. Previously, Sunlight was thought to be the energy source, that supported the base of every food web on our planet. But organisms in these deep, dark, ecosystems have no access to sunlight, and instead metabolize hydrogen sulfide or other chemicals through different processes. With only 5% of the ocean explored, many more scientific discoveries await our future generations of explorers in this final unknown frontier of our planet Earth. Governments and their agencies at all levels, from the smallest township to densely populated states, 
are trying harder than ever before to be more approachable and accessible to the residents of the area they serve. In the past, public meetings and traditional media were the mainstay of communication. Unless there is a big issue affecting a lot of people, these meetings are sparsely attended by the general public. But these days, the use of social media has changed the scenario. Websites have gone a long way in making government more accessible. Social media in government is a game changer. After all, not many things have changed the way the public interacts with governments, more than social media. On social media, people can engage in direct dialogue with politicians, civic officials, and even entire government agencies. It also gives them a chance to engage back. We also know how important it is for governments not only to adapt to a rapidly advancing world, but also how to take advantage of new forms of communication. Social media isn't just a good way to share memes and keep up with what's trending. It can also be a very powerful way for government agencies to interact with the public. Timeless lessons from Nelson Mandela's life story will endure for years to come. Mandela was a gifted visionary. He exercised a full range of cognitive, emotional and behavioral abilities to bring about profound change in South Africa. All leaders who aspire to be more strategic can learn from Mandela's behavior that distinguishes him as a true strategic leader. Mandela looked ahead and could see that South Africa's system of apartheid would not survive into the future. From his prison cell, he strategically assessed his moves and anticipated reactions. When offered freedom in exchange for renouncing opposition to the government, Mandela refused the offer. Mandela stood out among prisoners and guards as a man of principle and dignity, willing to sacrifice his life for his beliefs. Despite harsh prison life, Mandela mustered energy to challenge his keepers. Through word, deed and symbol, he challenged the system that denied him liberty. Mandela exemplifies how a strategic leader adjusts strategy and execution amid complex social, political, legal and economic forces without compromising deeply held values. Leadership is not just about motivating people and creating political support for a strategy, but also about maintaining broad support through successive adjustments to the plan. Coffee was introduced to Vietnam in the 1800s, and throughout the French colonial period, Arabica coffee was actually grown on many French-owned plantations. Nonetheless, due to a variety of political and economic factors, Vietnam was slow to achieve any real relevance as a coffee-producing nation. As of 1990, Vietnam was responsible for a tiny 1% of world coffee trade. This had all changed by 1990 by which point Vietnam had reached its current place as the second highest producing coffee country in the world after Brazil, a result of heavy investment in coffee production, made possible by the liberalization of land ownership in the mid-1980s and World Bank policy recommendations, incentivizing farmers to produce coffee for export. The country's story of rapid growth, however, left little room for high-quality coffee. Some 95% of the country's production is robusta, and although Arabica coffee production has been increasing in recent years due to the expansion and growing area and yield improvement, it still accounts for very little of the overall coffee production in Vietnam. Vietnam's coffee industry is expected to grow strongly in the coming years, as the population continues to expand at a rate of about 1 million people a year, and the country and the tastes of its people become more sophisticated. Increased activity at both consumer and trade levels from local and international players is another factor that is expected to fuel the industry's growth. If you look back through history, it's easy to spot examples of languages that were once prominent and later disappeared from use. Take Latin for example, you may have studied the language in high school, but it's a dead language. 
written and studied, but not spoken out of more than 7,000 languages spoken on our planet, a language dies every two weeks, ceasing to be actively spoken. Why do languages go extinct? The process of a culture and a people completely abandoning an entire language takes a long time, even spanning several generations. When a new dominant language appears on the scene, an eventual erosion of the older language occurs. Language shifts happen throughout history as one tongue overtakes another. For example, in the UK, the shift from Cornish to English has been occurring for decades and continues today. Other reasons for a language becoming extinct include political persecution, globalization, and a lack of preservation. For much of the 20th century, governments across the world have coerced indigenous peoples to adopt a common national language, thus forcing native languages to the sidelines and eventually to the ash heap of history. Bone health is a critical factor for healthy aging. Bones are responsible for many of the body's functions, including movement, organ protection, blood cell production, mineral storage, and support for the rest of our body. Genes contribute to an individual's bone health. Environmental factors, such as diet and physical activity also play a critical role in the health of bones throughout the lifespan, and importantly these factors can be modified. Nutritional deficiencies, such as insufficient vitamin D intake, can result in weak, poorly mineralized bones, and hence bone mass and strength. The most common bone disease is osteoporosis, which typically doesn't occur until late in life. Bone loss results as bones continue to break down, but bone formation, or remodeling, is reduced. The resultant loss of bone mass leads to structural abnormalities, that make the skeleton more fragile. This resultant fragility increases, the risk of fractures with or without trauma. Traditionally, European and American theatrical dance centered on ballet. However, in the early 20th century, it became fashionable in dance circles to rebel against the strictures of tradition. The first two well-known American dancers to break away from classical ballet were Isadora Duncan and Ruth St. Denis. Although their styles differed, Duncan and St. Denis's unconventional approaches opened the door to a new era in dance history, the American modern dance movement of the 1920s. Leaders of this movement based their works on personal experience, using their bodies as instruments to express such emotions as passion, fear, joy, or grief. Rather than adhering to a set form and a limited range of gestures, as in ballet, the dancer created form as an outgrowth of his or her own communicative impulses. Since its founding, modern dance has been redefined many times. Though it clearly is not ballet by any traditional definition, it often incorporates balletic movement, and though it may also refer to any number of additional dance elements those of folk dancing or ethnic, religious, or social dancing, for example, it may also examine one simple aspect of movement. As modern dance changes in the concepts and practices of new generations of choreographers, the meaning of the term modern dance grows more ambiguous. It is often observed that some people are more motivated than others. The underlying mechanisms driving motivation have been long studied by the scientists. Psychologists make a distinction between two approaches that people take to human capacities and character traits. She refers to the first as a fixed mindset. People with a fixed mindset see their capacities, for example their intelligence, as static. They believe that your capabilities, for example your level of intelligence or musicality, are largely determined by natural talent that can only be developed to a very minor extent, if at all. She refers to the second approach as a growth mindset. People with a growth mindset see their capabilities as innate potential, which is there to be developed. 
People with a fixed mindset regarding a particular capacity tend to focus on proving that they already possess this capacity rather than on the process of learning. They neglect the learning process, which obviously stunts their development and affects the way they function. People with a growth mindset, on the other hand, tend to make an effort to learn and develop strategies for learning and improving their long-term performance. A person's mindset defines their motivation or lack of it in pursuing education, career, sports and everything else.